Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. How confident is Mahamoitra that the appeal she's brought in the Supreme Court against the remission granted to 11 people guilty of raping Bilkis Banu and murdering seven members of her family will meet with success? That's one of the key issues I shall raise today with the well-known and highly regarded Trinamool MP. Mahamoitra, let me start with that simple question. Why did you appeal to the Supreme Court? against the remission granted to 11 people guilty of raping Bilkis Banu and murdering seven members of her family, when the same Supreme Court is the entity that actually set in motion the remission process with several questionable decisions. Uh, Karan, right up front, first thank you for having me here. And uh, right up front, I'd just like to put out a caveat that I am a petitioner in the court currently. The case is sub judice, so I, it would be very inappropriate for me to, to sort of comment on the, some of the judicial aspects of it. So I will try and keep it completely to the petition and what has prompted me to file it rather than uh, remark on some technicalities which may not be appropriate. I'm not asking you to comment right. on the judicial aspects. I'm asking right. you where does your confidence come right. that the very yes. court that set in motion the process of remission with highly questionable decisions can grant you success in your appeal? Um, I'm going to make, I'm going to answer that very con concisely. Number one, this is not an appeal. Colloquially, you might call it an appeal. Uh, when you have a, c a case like this, uh, you, you can go to the Supreme Court under its appellate jurisdiction. So you can ask for a review petition, which technically Bilkis, the CBI or the state government can do. What I have done is gone to the Supreme Court under original jurisdiction, which the other co-petitioners have done as well, which is filed a fresh writ under Article 32. That I understand. So but where is, do you have hope of success? Uh, Look, the Supreme Court is the ultimate court of the land. And I think it is wrong on our part or all of our parts to assume that the Supreme Court has somehow set in motion this unfortunate chain of events. If you look at what has happened, the Supreme Court was talking about jurisdiction and about whether remission is allowed. As far as the law of the land is concerned, remission after 14 years is technically up for consideration. So they have only, they have not said, please free the convicts. And so I'm not the judgment saying, is very different from and, and I'm not saying that either. What I'm pointing out to you is that the process that the Supreme Court has set in motion is based upon some very questionable decisions the court has taken. Let me identify one of them and then you reply to it. Perhaps the most controversial and the questionable decision that the Supreme Court has taken is that remission should be heard in Gujarat. That is a clear breach of section 4327B of the Criminal Procedure Code, which explicitly says that in fact remission must be heard in the state where the offender was sentenced. What the Supreme Court has done by permitting Gujarat to hear it is to turn the law of the land on its head, which is why I ask, why then are you confident that the court that has clearly made an error will find in your favor in the end? I think um, I disagree completely with this line of reasoning. And I think it is frankly immaterial whether Gujarat, let me finish, whether Gujarat or Maharashtra considers it. 
I, it is within, uh, let me finish Karan, it is, it, it is completely immaterial whether it's Gujarat or Maharashtra, that is not something that I've even challenged in my petition. There is nothing to say that the, that uh, Maharashtra would have come up with a perfect decision. It is not the question of, jur of jurisdiction. I think the Supreme Court has interpreted, interpreted that, the, that Gujarat was within its rights to look at it and that is something they're entitled to do. The question Except is, no, hear me out, hear me out, no, 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 hear me out. But hear it's me the out. wrong interpretation no, 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 hear me out. that Karan, violates Karan, the written law of the land. Karan, do not interrupt, Karan. That is not, that is not the question. It is very easy to fall into the trap. Let us not fall into the trap. It is not whether Gujarat, Maharashtra, Arunachal or West Bengal is, the question is not of jurisdiction. The question is, wherever it is, has there been application of the law? So I have not asked, my question is, whoever has done it, let us bring on on record the facts and has there been application of law? Let it me is reply not a question of whether Gujarat does it or Maharashtra let, let does me it. Reply that's to that. not even a question that's up for The review. first point I'm making is that the Supreme Court has breached section 4327B of the Criminal Procedure Code. That is the law of the land. No. The Supreme Court has breached I, it and turned it on its head. I, in, no, in which case, look, that, that is something that a review petition can do. That is not a technicality that I have gone into. And but I think there's a bigger moral question here. <coughs> not just that they've breached a section of the Criminal Procedure Code. The bigger moral question is this. In 2004, the Supreme Court itself moved the Bilkis Banu case from Gujarat to Maharashtra because there was apprehension of bias and prejudice in Gujarat. Yes. Now, when it's a question of the remission being considered, how come this fear of unfairness, this fear of bias look, hasn't occurred to that's, the court? That's, look, this again, I will put on record that, that it is inappropriate for me to talk about any bias or anything on the part of the court. As a petitioner, I have full faith in the court and it is very important to note here that in my petition, I have not asked for a review on jurisdiction. That I think we are getting entangled in these technicalities. But I'm not talking about no, a let review me finish, on jurisdiction let me finish, either. Let me finish. Let me finish, let me finish Karan. It is, it is not talking about the technicalities. The question here is, whichever state is looking at it, has the law, has there been application of mind and thereafter Thereafter, since it has gone back to Gujarat, has has the has they, have they looked at the three things? Have they consulted the center? Have they looked at looked at have they asked, sought the opinion of the presiding uh, judge at of the trial court currently and Justice Salvi, who was then there? These as have been application of mind. These are the things that we see well, to be on record. Okay, let's come to those because yes. those were the next question I was yes. going to ask. But I'm going to underline for the audience that the first reason why people doubt that you will have success is because the Supreme Court has clearly breached a section of the criminal procedure law by giving the case to Gujarat to hear rather than Maharashtra. And secondly, the Supreme Court has also overlooked a concern it had itself in 2004 that there would be bias in Gujarat, which is why they sent it to Maharashtra. Now, when it's a question of remission, they've sent it right back to Gujarat, overlooking this concern about bias. But leave that aside, we've yeah. argued that over. Let's come now to the issues that you raised. And once again, the question is this, given that so many things went wrong when Gujarat heard the remission, why has the Supreme Court not taken suo moto cognizance without waiting for you or others to file an appeal? And let me point out to the audience the things that went wrong. First of all, the judge that heard the original case was not consulted. He said so himself on record. I'm talking about Justice Salvi. Secondly, it's almost certain that the central government wasn't consulted, even though Section 435 makes it obligatory that in a case handled by the CBI, the central government must be consulted. And thirdly, the committee that recommended remission comprised five functionaries of the BJP, two of whom are BJP MLAs. Now, given all of this, why did the court not itself take suo moto cognizance, why did they wait for people like you to come and appeal to prop them? Look, Karan, I think again, I think you're doing the entire cause a disservice by pointing the finger at the Supreme Court. The Supreme, I am not here, I'm a petitioner in the Supreme Court on this particular case. Hear me out. I am I'm not, not here, Go no, no, I'm not here to sort of point fingers at the court. I leave, I have petitioned the court as a public servant, as a person who, as a woman, as an elected representative in this land, and I don't think this fight is Bilkis's alone. And I think that that um, the, fa the the so when Bilkis went to the Supreme Court, this case was originally in Gujarat. Gujarat said they would file a closure report. They said there's nothing to this case. Bilkis went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in its wisdom, moved this to a special CBI court in the case of Maharashtra, in the state of Maharashtra. They were convicted. They did not appeal. When they, they went to the Bombay High Court, the Bombay High Court judgment is a scathing judgment. They upheld the CBI court's judgment, right? 
In 2019, when it went to the Supreme Court, Justice Deepak Gupta was a bench of three that awarded exemplary compensation of 50 lakhs to Bilkis but, but and said none the of that's in doubt. Give me none a of that's in doubt. But that's and I'm not questioning so, so it. So I don't think there is anything as far as yes, it would have been good if they had taken so much cognizance. Precisely my question: Why did they? But but you have to understand, they were released on the 15th of August. We went to court on the 22nd. Even the remission order has not even the reason. People can ask, why is Bilkis not gone to court? Why has the CBI not gone to court, Karan? Mm, even so the remission what? order has not been you uploaded. Went, you went to court a week after the remission yes, happened. And the, the Supreme court, court has, has often notice. The Supreme Court has often responded faster when things are in the press Look, because they are matters of urgent concern. It may and be, I'm pointing out to you it that may so be, many it things been nice. went wrong. Why did the Supreme Court not take I cannot so much to cognizance? Look, I cannot Sat answer. Given I, I could not. I I cannot answer on the on behalf of what the Supreme Court should or should not have done. It is not my locus to do that. As a petitioner, I am before the Supreme Court. I have petitioned the Supreme Court. The P Supreme Court has issued notice on our petition and given a date for 10 days. Let me I think within the framework of what is allowed, I think that is an as good an outcome as we can ask. Once for. again, there is a moral issue here as well. Yeah. The Supreme Court has the power to take suo moto cognizance. It didn't exercise that power. That's the first question I asked. Why didn't it? But there's That's a not a question I can answer. Absolutely. Right? I'm simply pointing out yeah. that by not exercising that power, people will question whether now when you go and appeal, they will actually be favorable. But let me put the moral question to you. The Supreme Court, as I keep pointing out, set in motion the process that led to remission. If that remission ends up with the wrong outcome, Surely it's incumbent on the court to step in and rectify no. matters. Even that they didn't do. No, That's a moral I, I disagree. Reason. I, That's a I moral disagree. Reason. I disagree with this entire line of questioning, and I think we're actually doing uh, Bilkis Banu's case a great disservice by not concentrating on the executive part of the of the remission process, which is what is the most important thing to concentrate on, and not in the judicial. No, part I'm of not it. doing Bilkis Banu's no, no, case. Second. Any me, misrepresentation or unfairness. I'm questioning why, finish, your, why you finish. are confident the court will see because no favor. I do not see anything anything in which any court has done which has set into process the remission. The convicts were not released because any court of the land asked them to be released. That is number one. When you when you sit for the UPSC exams and you pass a certain, uh, you, you get a certain percentage, you're called in for the interview. Whether you pass the interview or not is what determines you are taken. The law of the land today, whether we like it or not, allows remission. Even mm. if you're convicted of triple murder. Absolutely. After 14 years, but, you're, but you're up missing, all that the question, not at all. You're, all you're that missing the, no, the point. I'm not missing the point. The question that was up before the Supreme Court on one of the convicts was is are they permissible to be considered for remission and the straight answer to that is under the law of the land after 14 years they are considered that wasn't the that straight answer the, the court gave that I'm is afraid no. no the court also ruled that the remission will be decided by Gujarat when in fact Section 4327B explicitly make, there says is nothing it to has say, to be the state no, where the no, no, offender no. There is nothing to sentenced. say. There is nothing to say, Karan. We have to look at, but we the, have to look I'm at the executive the power. I'm quoting the section to you. It does, even, even within that, they have the power to interpret it differently. But hang on a second. They, have, they don't have the yes, power to do. interpret they do. it differently. They do. Then that is, something, that is something that somebody will bring up on review. To me, that is not a point that I have brought up. Look, Karan, we are we okay. have been fifteen minutes into the interview. Question, we are nickeling and diming on what the no, Supreme no, let Court me ask is doing or question. not doing. My Let's concentrate object. on what the executive is doing. Hang on, my I'll come to the executive in a moment's time. I'm not going to leave out the executive. My first set of questions are to do with the fact that you have confidence the court will yes, find in your favor. I'm questioning that confidence. Look. Let me finish and then you answer. And I'm questioning that confidence on several grounds. The first ground is what I call the questionable decisions on the basis of which Gujarat was allowed to handle the remission case. The second is that the court didn't take suo moto cognizance, which it could have, perhaps even morally should have, because so many things went wrong. But there's a third reason, and this may be embarrassing for you, so I'll accept it if it is, but there's a third reason why your confidence in the court could be questionable. And it's the hint, no more than a hint, that the court gave on the 25th of August when Justice Ajay Rustogi, who's actually one of the judges hearing this matter, asked the following question, and I'm quoting him, merely because the act was horrific, is that sufficient to say remission is wrong? And then he added, day in and day out, remission is granted to convicts of life sentence. What is the exception? Now that suggests that perhaps the court believes that this is not as straightforward and clear cut a matter as you do. That is one other reason okay. for questioning your confidence. Uh, Karan, again, I will have to put on record that is, I am a petitioner currently in the court of 
Justice Rastogi, it is exceedingly inappropriate for me to comment on anything that the Honorable Judge may or may not have said. So I will have to put that on aside. But I, what I will ask, tell you very categorically, and again, I ask you to please bring it back to point, which is that it is that remission is accepted law. It is settled law in India that no matter how horrific the crime, even if you're convicted of triple murder, after 14 years, you are up for remission. But I'm that not disputing the, that. That is there At is no well, point that have is I all, disputed that. Well, that is all that that particular judgment referred to is that are you up for remission? You are up for remission. It is then up to the executive to decide on a case by case basis using application of mind and the rule of law thereafter whether this particular case was up for remission. Let me put it like this. Remission. I know you can't respond to Justice Rustogi, and I understand that. But one reason why remission in this particular case is wrong morally yes. is because the crime was so horrific. But that and that's precisely what Justice Rustogi is questioning. No. He says merely because the act was horrific, is that sufficient to look, say remission is wrong? Actually, most people say it's wrong because no, no, the act that is, is horrific. That, the, be, look, there are, there, are, there are the exceptions to, the, to rem everyone in this country, everyone in law, even like I said, even if you're convicted of double murder, you are entitled to remission. That's not the point. That no is one's settled denying law. it. That, that's, well, that is all the limited point that the court has made. Please understand. Uh, the court, I'm not that, sure that that is, that's no, the, that, limited that point, is the limited point. In which case it was very look, ineptly I, made, if no, I can no, use no, that no, word. I cannot, again, Karan, I would really earnestly urge you not to tread along that line of questioning okay. at all. Let me put it like this. Let's wrap up this section and I'll come to the executive moment's time. But I've given the audience and you three, four reasons why confidence that the court will find in your favor is questionable. You don't believe it's questionable. Am I right? You have full faith the court will look, find look, in your what favor. what is my petition? You have to see what the limited purview of my petition is. I have not filed this. It's not a review petition. What we have said is in this particular case, the executive, which is the Gujarat government, and it's uh, the appropriate authority, which is this particular panel, the 10-member panel, which ruled on remission, uh, we have got, there are a few things that are not on board. What my petition says is bring all the facts on board. The remission order is not yet in public domain. Even Bilkis has not got a copy of the remission order. So even if you to file a review, that particular order is not in but public domain. But what domain. is the outcome you want? So we would like that all the as all the facts have to be brought on board, and, and then the legality of the remission can only and be questioned. And what you are hoping for is that the remission will be rescinded. Yes, it will. If it is not followed the procedure of law, it will be rescinded. But the point I am making <laughs> to you is that your confidence that the remission will be rescinded can be questioned on no, the no, grounds no. that, that I just that, raised. Then you are very. Then you are questioning. I do not ascribe any motive. Any other. I am not ascribing a motive to either. Any court. No, I am not ascribing a motive. I am simply pointing out. The way the court has handled this can, raises I do not think doubts the in question, people's no, minds. I, I do not think. I think as far as the CBI court was concerned, as far as the Bombay High Court was concerned, and as far as the Supreme but Court was concerned. I'm only talking about the Supreme Court. No, even the Supreme Court, I think in 19, awarded exemplary punishment to Bilkis. Bano, it has issued notice but in I'm that case. But I'm talking about what the Supreme Court did in May in when the they Supreme decided court that the ruling remission would be handled by Gujarat. They were ruling on the limited, like I said, let us not harp okay. on what the Supreme Court done, has done or not done. The question is whether hereafter, whether the executive the Gujarat government has done things according to the law and that is what we need Let's right now to be Let's then come to the executive yes. and the executive I want to talk to you about is in fact the central government. Right. Given that this remission happened literally hours after the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech when he spoke at great lengths about Nari Shakti and the need to honour women. Given that it almost certainly happened without consulting the government in defiance of Section 435 and given that it's in complete breach of the central government's own recent guidelines on remission, don't you think Mr. Modi's government should have been the one to go to the Supreme Court uh, and appeal against uh, it? Now, this is a, this uh, this this question actually. We need to really go into this in depth. There are two things. I listened to what the Prime Minister said, and the Prime Minister, I have. There's nothing wrong with what he said. He said there's a vikriti, which is some kind of a perversion in society today, that is encouraging uh, the language we use, the actions we take. Uh, you know, these are all anti-women and we must correct it. And he has to be applauded for saying that. I'm not saying anything against that. But if you look, if you compare that with what the reality is, and the NCRB figures came out yesterday, and you look at crimes against women, and they increased 15.3% between 2020 and 2021. How is this an answer to my question? I, I will finish the answer, please note. 
please let me finish, Karan. You have to stop interrupting. It really uh, it spoils the, the train of thought. So I think the prime minister, when he's appealing to somebody, when he says it sounds very good on on the from the red fort, but when he's talking about reality, he doesn't reflect it. The second thing that he's talking about is that he talks about Nari Shakti and all of that. This is a prime minister who changed the entire cabinet of Gujarat overnight. It is unthinkable that for a prime minister and for a central government that literally changed the Gujarat cabinet overnight would not be in the know of this decision made by the Gujarat government in a case as sensitive as this. So I think while he was saying it from the, from the annals of the Red Fort, it is unthinkable that did not know that the process of remission is in process already. Number one, the BJP government is a very calculated government. To say that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing does not work for this government, number one. The second thing is the executive, when you think of the, when you think of what the uh, composition of that particular committee was, the composition of that committee was completely screwed towards the ruling party. You had two MLAs, sitting MLAs, one of who has made the most ghastly and sensitive comments. The second is you had two social workers who were current and past members of the BJP. You had the district collector, the jail superintendent, the superintendent of police, all of who report to the state government. And so in this case, it is unthinkable that the central government did not know. On paper, the three checks that are required, one is uh, the check from the from the central government that is not that is not part of public record that's something we've asked to be placed the second is the presiding court uh, judge was not trial court judge was not asked the current one plus justice salve who ruled on it when he was the cbi judge was not asked but can I just say yeah. before we get lost in detail are you saying that a it's unthinkable that the prime minister and the central government did not know that the gujarat state government was going to grant remission it and is, secondly yes. if they did know and they did not object and did not go in appeal to the Supreme Court themselves, it means they have no problem with the remission. Clearly, because it is, like I said, it is unthinkable that in a case as sensitive as this and in a crime as horrific as this, that the Gujarat government, whose cabinet had been changed overnight by the prime minister, would not have consul consulted with the central government, number one. Number two, on paper, I don't know if they've asked for uh, permission or not. That is something that we have asked to be placed on record in the court. If they have given permission, we will know. If they have not, then the law of the land has not been followed. But it is unthinkable that they would not know, at least informally, that remission would be granted. There's one reason to assume that they were not consulted because if they had been consulted, it would be hypocritical to give permission for remission, A, because it contradicts the very recently announced central government guidelines on remission, which I believe came out just a couple of days before Independence Day. And secondly, because it would contradict the strong pitch the Prime Minister made on Independence Day when he spoke about Nari Shakti. I, I, Therefore, if he did give permission, it would be hypocritical. So one assumes that he's not a hypocrite. And in fact, permission wasn't or cons consultation wasn't available. I mean, honestly, Karan, if you're sitting here and asking me that the BJP government is not a hypocritical government, that the leadership of the BJP are not hypocrites, then I don't even know what to say. I think it is established fact that there has never been a more hypocritical government than the current then dispensation. Then let me ask you this. The truth, as far as I know, is that not a single member of the Modi government has spoken about the remission in any form at all. Absolutely. Even the Minister for Women and Child Development, Smriti Irani, who's fairly voluble when she wants to be, has had nothing to say. What does that tell you about the Modi government's attitude to honouring women, empowering women, and to this whole Nari Shakti campaign? Look, we've never had a more misogynist, and I say this as a woman who's in parliament. I face them every day. There has never been a more patriarchal, misogynist government at the centre in India. And I say this on record as a matter of fact. The second thing is that it is, it is um, when you talk about the Chokidar, if you are indeed the Chokidar, and I, let, me give, let me give the Prime Minister, the Honorable Prime Minister, benefit of the doubt. He is the Chokidar. You cannot be a Chokidar of convenience. You cannot choose to protect one and not protect the other. So which is why I asked the question. I said, is Bilkis Bano a woman or a Muslim? India had better make up its mind. Because if she's a woman, then all this talk about Nari Shakti and womanhood means that the BJP has to speak up for her. And if she's a Muslim and in the BJP's eyes, she's a second class or a third class citizen not worth talking about, then let's put her aside. Just to make it clear, what you're suggesting is that because she's a Muslim, the BJP's rhetoric 
And I'm deliberately saying rhetoric yes. about women and women's empowerment doesn't, doesn't apply, apply to her. Absolutely, it just doesn't apply here. This is this is electoral convenience. It's the politics of convenience. I mean, if you look at the honourable minister that you that you just mentioned, just about three weeks ago during the monsoon session, there was an incident where I think uh, the leader of the Congress, the leader of the uh, the Congress, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, had said something about Rashtrapati instead of Rashtrapati, and that is something being a Bengali speaker. That's a that's a mistake that can happen with anybody. They were shouting and screaming and. You know all about how he's insulted Nari Shakti for one little slip of the tongue, shouting, screaming, histrionics of the first order, and for something as important as this, there is nobody that has stood up from the BJP. And it's all because she's a Muslim. Uh, I think it's it's because it doesn't suit their it doesn't suit their that could be very well be part of it. I think it's part of it. I'm not saying it, but I think it's very well part of it because if she were only a woman, then how does it fit into their Nari Shakti uh, rhetoric? It now, when the convicts were released. They yeah. were welcomed with garlands and laddus. One of the members of the revision committee actually said they were Brahmins with good sanskar. Right. What sort of message does that send Balkis Banu? And what sort of message does it send the women of India? Look, I think the fact that they were released, um, uh, there is a remission policy in place. Now, had, had they just been released, we could have gone and said, bring the facts on board. There has been non-application of mind. In this particular case, there can be no wholesale remission of all 11 convicts. Now, please understand, it is necessary to reiterate the gravity of these crimes. Bilkis Bano was raped 22 times. Her mother was raped. Her two sisters were raped. 14 members in total were killed, seven of her own family, including her three-year-old child, whose head was smashed, whose body was never found. There were, the bodies were thrown in a ravine. Seven bodies were, uh, five bodies were recovered and they had been decapitated. So not only had they, the Bombay High Court judgment lays out very clearly that not only had they been murdered, they had been decapitated. So these were not crimes that were normal crimes. These were obviously well thought out, premeditated. The Bombay High Court judgment calls it a massacre. Please understand. These are the crimes we're looking at. When these men come out, this we're is not, the reason why remission is so singularly which is, which inappropriate. Which is inappropriate, and which is why we are questioning for all the facts of the remission to be brought on record that the Supreme Court can then judge if any illegality was done and if the remission will be reset. I won't that go is into my that petition. debate again, but yes. this is also why Justice Rastogi's question is so no, disturbing. But leave that aside. So, so, so when these horrific when Convicts they come out, are welcomed with laddus and called Brahmins they and are, felicitated. Are, what does it tell us? It like Bilka says that she says, you know, this is is this how? And that's a very poignant thing she said. She said, is this how justice supposed to end? And that that one line, I think, touched me more than anything else. I said, Bilkis fought for, she got justice. 2002, it happened. Now, 17 years she fought. Her final compensation came in 2019. 2008 was the was the, when they were convicted. 14 years later, she has just got her 50 lakhs two years ago. Her life is back on track. Again, her life is under threat. She is in hiding. Uh, you know, people from her community. Rape is an impact. Gang rape is an impact crime. It doesn't just impact the person. It impacts communities. It impacts society. So when you look at it like that, the fact that they were felicitated, given tilaks and garlands and laddus. I mean, Justice Gupta said it's immoral. It's unjust. It's unfair. And what message does it send to the women of India? It sends them to the women of exa exactly what I said, that misogyny, patriarchy, and more than that, that criminal law, which never before in India has been decided on religion, caste, and community. Today, criminal law, the realm of criminal law has actually been, show me your face, and I will then show you the judgment. One of the most powerful moments of that long answer was when you recounted in horrific detail exactly what had happened to Bilkis, yeah. her three-year-old child, her family members, how they weren't just killed, they were decapitated as well. Right. You sketched out that horrific crime. And as I said, that's why in this case, remission is so singularly immoral and wrong. Yes. Suppose at the end, the Supreme Court does not send these people back to jail. Suppose it accepts that remission was done legally and correctly and accepts that they can stay free. How would you interpret that outcome? Look, we will get to that. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But I it's think a real right possibility. Now, it's a real possibility. But we will, we will cross that bridge when we get to it. As of now, I think what we need right now is for the... Everything is now shrouded in mystery. 
The fact that Bilkis Bano today has not got a copy of the remission order. But that's another question. No, no, that, no that's not this. the point. The, that's not the point. Everything no, no, today I'm asking is a different question. Let's no, not, let's no, not no, deflect. No. One, let, what, let no, all no, the no. facts be brought on I, record. I, I, I have full faith once the facts are brought on record, Karan, that the illegality of this, the non-application of mind of the executive, in this particular case, the wholesale sort of, I would say, uh, pardon granted to all of them, not and not on a case by case basis. All of these will be on record, and I have full faith in the judiciary. So you're saying that you don't want to even talk about the possibility of the Supreme Court leaving them free because you have full faith I that do. when the facts are brought on record, Absolutely. the Supreme Court will send them back to jail. Yes, I do think that this, as as far as we can see, and you have brought many of these things out, and as far as look, people in India. There's something about the very grave crimes that people fundamentally know whether they're right or wrong. But this is something that everyone problem, knows this feels wrong. But the problem with the remission is that yeah. the process wasn't illegal, except for the informities I've pointed out, which you no, don't no, want no, to no, accept. No, no, no. No, let, me finish. let me finish. Yeah. The problem is that the process wasn't illegal, except for the informities I've pointed out. The principal one being Gujarat hearing it rather than Maharashtra. No, no, no. It was legal. But it was immoral. No, no. The problem is, suppose the Supreme Court says no. that the process was legal, therefore we stand. No, 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 no. There are two or three checks where even the legality will be questioned, right? And jurisdiction is not one of them. Well, I have not questioned jurisdiction in my in in the in my petition, right? That's up for review. That's a separate petition. Even the illegality of what Gujarat has done is not uh, is up for uh, um, uh, for uh, deliberation. Number one, they have to consult the center. Let us see if they've consulted the center, yes or no. Number one. Number two, the presiding trial court judge has to be consulted, whether it's the trial court judge today or whether it's Justice Salvi. Salvi has gone on record saying that he was not consulted. It remains to be seen if the presiding CBI court judge today was consulted. So on these two checks, if one or the other was not done, then you have illegality right there. Okay. We're coming right to the end of this interview. Tell me this. Yeah. Do you believe the Bilkis Banu case has become a litmus test of the moment? A litmus test for women, a litmus test for the sanctity of justice, but also a litmus test for the sort of country we want to be. Yeah, I think yes to all of that. Yes to all of that. And I think that this is something like, which is one of the reasons I was, uh, you know, going back and forth with you at the beginning of the interview was, this is not about the technicalities of it. This is a crime and the remission, the sight of these convicts coming out and being felicitated and given laddus and tilaks and the fact that someone who sat on the committee comes out and he's even said in one of the interviews, he says, I'm not even sure that they're, you know, I'm not even sure if they were guilty. You can only sit on a remission panel if you're accepting the fact that these people, their guilt is not up for question. They've been convicted over and over again. Their conviction has been upheld by the Bombay High Court. So the fact that this is a slap in the face of natural justice on the touchstone of the Constitution, Article 15, which says there is no discrimination on the basis of sex, religion, caste. Uh, so I think all of these things that we hold so sacred, that's why this case is hitting us all in the gut. That's why this is not where someone says, why do you have locusts? Why are you fighting? Why is, isn't it up to Bilkis? And my answer to that is, Bilkis has fought the fight. It is for the rest of us today, as Indians, as women, as right-thinking, moral, upright citizens, that we stand up for the right thing and we fight the fight along with Bilkis. In other words, the sort of country we want to be, that and we our, hopefully and, were at one point. And our faith in justice. Yes. Both will depend upon what outcome emerges Absolutely. from the Supreme Court. Absolutely. My last question. A recent report in the BBC on the Bilkis Banu remission had voices abroad asking a critical question. Has rape been normalized in India? Rape has been weaponized in India. In the last five years, five to seven years, rape has been weaponized in India. Like I said, it's an impact crime. Rape is not just about the victim who's been raped. It's about the community. So rape is largely being used. And the whataboutery, if, even if you see on social media and you see the language that is coming out of the right wing, it is the whataboutery suggesting uh, um, sort of surrounding rape and crimes against women is, uh, like I said, there's a moral spectrum. But the ease with which this remission happened has that 
normalized rape or does it suggest the normalization it of rape? It suggests not only the normalization of gang rape. Please understand the question. In this particular case, it was not just gang rape. It was murder. These Each of these men had been convicted of not just one, but two or three counts of murder. And the remission suggests the normalization it's both of, of gang rape and murder. I, I, not only that, what it suggests, the normalization, like I said, a remission policy exists. Every criminal is entitled to remission and it has to be decided on a case by case basis in accordance with the law. The question is what is normalization is when they come out and they are being felicitated with Carlins and Laddus. I think that sight more than anything else is in the kick in the gut to all of us. So you agree with those voices on the BBC? They were raising uh, yes, an issue of, of great concern. Not only normalization, like I said, it's weaponization. Mawa Moitra, thank you very much thank for you. talking to me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.